We're going to get started for the session on education. Always good to have a nice non-controversial topic uh, right after you've talked about the arts. But um, uh, we have a distinguished panel here, and let me introduce them first. Uh, immediately to, to my left is uh, Gregory Crawford. He's the Dean of Science at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and to his left is uh, Lenore Tedescu, Tedesco. Excuse me. She's the Director of the Center for Earth and Environmental Science at IUPUI and also a professor there. Uh, um, Dwayne Matthews, the Vice President for Policy and Strategy uh, of our very own Illumina Foundation of Education. Uh, and uh, last but not least, David Radcliffe, the Hagigi head of the School of Engineering Education at Purdue University. Thank you all for being here. A very nice, diverse group. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, uh, I was told to talk for 10 minutes. We don't have 10 minutes. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes of what I would have said to move this along. Uh, how many of you saw the recent uh, uh, cover story on uh, Newsweek about the creativity crisis in American schools? Uh, several people. Um, uh, it's good reading, so I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> but, but, but before I, I, I get into that, I want to say that uh, I've always been a big fan of the IMA. And I told my wife when uh, we were first members, uh, probably it was probably over a dozen years ago, that one day it would be really cool to speak at the IMA, and she just scoffed at me at the time. So I do a little shout out to Scott. I have bragging rights tonight when I go home, which does not happen very often, so thank you, sir. Um, and then a comment at the previous panel just really cracked me up, talking about uh, rich people, nerds, and artists. Um, of course, a way of defining it, but I get it. Um, I don't know if you, any of you know what Comic-Con is in San Diego. It is the world's biggest collection of rich people, nerds, and artists. Uh, and it's a huge entertainment convention. Uh, and I literally talked to my wife into letting me go because I was doing it for background research, um, which she actually bought, and she had no interest in it. And it was one of the most interesting places I've ever been. Uh, but it goes to the point about how if you're chasing cool, you're not cool. Um, it was just really interesting to see all these people come from all these diverse backgrounds and do things that ranged from the bizarre to the creative, and, and then to have to struggle with how you actually define which is which. It was actually a lot of fun. Um, so I, I thought I'd just start very briefly here by talking about, um, about what we know about creativity in education. I think we actually know a lot more than people think we know. Um, I think we actually know an exceptional amount. We've been studying it for decades. Um, and, and I would argue that uh, at the society level, uh, this country has largely been uh, the world's creativity leader for the better part of at least the last half century or so. Um, uh, that's arguable, um, uh, but I think for the most part it's probably accurate. I think there's a few different reasons for this. Uh, previous panel talked about some of them. Um, uh, in general, though, at a more sociological level, uh, and I'm a psychologist, so, but uh, it, uh, from a sociological perspective, um, a lot of people point to our soft power. Uh, in that there are a lot of things about this country that attracted the world's best and the brightest and kept our best and the brightest here. Uh, and, and that's something that's starting to change, so I, I, think, I think we have to at least acknowledge that. And then generally, we have had, across the board, in general, uh, a fairly strong system of public and private education. Um, uh, uh, one of the previous panelists pointed out it's a very uneven, and that is certainly the case. But. Um, the best example I can give, um, I can give of this, uh, my, my center invited a very well-known national education figure to come and talk to us, you know, bringing an outside perspective, and within five minutes, he had absolutely insulted every single person in the room, and, what, what, uh, and then after that, he just thought he'd say, you know, there, there, there really are only three good schools in the entire United States, and I thought, well, that's a really interesting comment. We've got thousands of them. And he was like, no, no, I'm talking about universities. And then he named the three Ivy League institutions um, from which he has a degree. Uh, and he said, the rest of you are just horrible. And I thought, I actually paid for this guy to come here and insult <laughs> us. This is, this is ridiculous. And, um, uh, but this is the best part. Um, uh, the meekest Chinese student I have slowly raises her hand. And I'm thinking, what is she going to say? And she said, that's just stupid. That's just stupid. And it was such an honest moment. I thought, that was stupid. And she's the only one who had guts to say it. She's not even American. Um, and, uh, 
uh, the world's best and the brightest still do come here um, for their education. Increasingly, uh, they're coming from countries like China, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore to attend our high schools, which is a demographic trend that as much as we all beat up on high schools, and I do it a lot too, uh, it's worth noting that not everyone feels the same way that we do about some of our schools, which I think is really interesting. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, I was talking to someone who's, um, there's actually a big meeting of public university education deans in Indianapolis, right, right as we sit here. Um, and I was talking to someone who came in to speak um, uh, with them, I was very active at the national level. And she said that the number one question she gets about schools as she goes around the country is, why have we forsaken creativity? Why has the country turned its back on the creativity of students? Um, I thought that was really, really kind of fascinating. I know I'm concerned about it, I know many of you are concerned about it, but the fact that it's that much of a concern in every state and every community I thought was really interesting. That said, and this was the point of the whole Newsweek story, is that there is some evidence, and I think it's fairly limited evidence, but there is some evidence that the creativity of American students is actually declining. Um, uh, and that's really interesting because in general, test scores, no matter what you're testing, um, a psychological effect called the Flynn effect, test scores slowly rise over time. We're not actually sure why that happens. Any test that's ever been done, except for creativity tests in this country over the past 15 to 20 years, a pretty slow, steady decline of a few points on average every single year for the last couple of, last couple of decades. And granted, that's only a couple studies that, that, that have shown that. Um, but, that's, but that's a little bit frightening. And uh, one of the things that people have pointed out is that it could be our newfound fascination with testing. Um, and I, I think that's uh, a straw man argument, but it is worth noting that um, I, I, go to, I go to China um, uh, several times a year. And uh, one of the first times I was there, I was out with some Chinese colleagues. Um, and as bad as my Mandarin is now, it was really bad then. So I was using a translator, and someone asked me, you know, what's the, what's the, big, the big accountability push? Can you actually describe that to us? And, and I said, well, you know, we're starting to get more serious about testing. Some states weren't actually testing. There was very little accountability. We're focusing on these areas. We're gonna be testing in every grade now. It gets translated, they all burst into laughter. And I thought, that didn't get translated right. And so I was like, oh, why is that funny? And they're like, oh, we, we, we actually thought you were joking. We've been doing that for 50 years. We're moving away toward a more American model which promotes creativity and problem solving. Why on earth would you want to adopt the Chinese model? That's stupid. And I laughed and pretended that I had actually been joking because um, it was really embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 think, I think it's also worth noting um, the, the world has changed. I don't need to tell anybody that, especially the last decade, right? Um, immigration patterns have changed. Uh, the National Academies of Science had a report about a 12 to 18 months ago that started to track um, the best and the brightest that we did attract here uh, to see if it was true that they're actually starting to go back home instead of stay here. To, so instead of doing their innovation here, that they're going back. Um, historically, they have always wanted to stay here, and we generally let them. And that's where a lot of our American entrepreneurial success stories have come from. Um, they're not returning home in huge numbers, but they are starting to return home. More worrisome is that they're not coming here in the first place, because their institutions of higher education, their societies um, are starting to loosen up. They're getting a lot more freedom. They're getting better universities at home, which are much less expensive for them. Well, they have to make far fewer sacrifices. Um, so we're not necessarily attracting them as much as we used to, and we're not keeping them anymore. Why is this important, you say? Um, the problems in American education have not really changed in many, many, many years. Um, that really, and I'm hardly the first person to point this out, right? But um, uh, that wasn't a huge factor for us because we did have this extra supply of talent always wanted to come to the United States. We're finding increasingly that they're not coming, and even if they want to stay, it's increasingly hard for them, get, them to get visas to do so. These are the people who are our grandfathers, grandparents, grandmothers, great-great-grandparents uh, who came here to, fill, to fulfill that, that American dream. 
Uh, that's a big source of talent, and we're seeing that slowly start to trickle away, which I think is really exposing a lot of the problems we have with talent development within our own schools. Um, and at the same time, uh, we are certainly seeing other cultures uh, really accent creativity a lot more in their programs. And the best example I can give um, is uh, China again. Um, about every 10 years, five to 10 years, uh, the last two have been about a decade apart, they have a new roadmap for where Chinese education is going to go. The most recent roadmap came out this summer, about uh, the end of July. Um, and it broke uh, education down into uh, uh, roughly uh, six different categories. Uh, the first was um, early, childhood, early childhood care, excuse me, uh, late elementary, middle school, high school. Uh, high school is not mandatory in China. Um, so uh, expanding compulsory education through high school, higher education, which is a huge, huge push there. You want to guess what the sixth area was? Creativity. Creativity has become so important in the Chinese mindset that a sixth of their education resources in terms of planning have gone straight into creativity. This is the second plan now that has actually done that. Um, and I'm not an international alarmist, uh, but it is a little alarming to go into a Chinese high school and seeing uh, high school freshmen uh, doing advanced engineering projects. Uh, it does give you a little pause for thought, going, ooh, maybe there is a, something we have to worry about here. Um, uh, and I think our speaker this morning pointed, out, point, pointed it out best. We're never going to come up with more engineers than China or India. Um, uh, as if all of our high school students went into engineering, we still wouldn't be able to get enough engineers. Um, so the question is quality of education. And so. Uh, we're here today to talk about how do we, uh, is there a problem with creativity in education? Um, and, uh, and if so, what can we actually do about it? And then uh, hopefully also point out some of the things that we do have going for us positively. So with that, I'm going to start with Greg. Uh, Greg, you're both a teacher and you're uh, someone who uh, is using and has used knowledge to discover new knowledge and apply it. Can you give us an example of some of the work that you've done, a discovery, and, and how creativity factored into that? Thanks for, um, thanks for, it's been great to be here, so I wanted to thank everybody. It's been a lot of fun this morning. Um, I just would like to, a little bit intimidated coming up here today because talking about nerds and coolness and not explicitly said, I think nerds was used uh, synonymously with scientists and engineers <laughs> earlier today. So uh, I think we do have an image problem <laughs> to some extent. And if you ever Google uh, scientist or engineer, it comes up with people with big hair everywhere or, or, uh, or glasses and baldness and stuff like that. And unfortunately, I'm the latter here, so. I'd like to try to talk to you guys a little bit about um, some of the things that are going on in science here and some of the discoveries that, was, that, I, that I worked on and, and, uh, and sort of how creativity came into it. And I'd like to start back on a sort of the new scientist, but starting with sort of old scientists in terms of, if we look, take a look at Bohr, for example, famous physicist, very fundamental, but his discoveries in quantum mechanics came to flourish in terms of products 30 years later in terms of transistors and uh, the medical laser. If you look at what Edison did, although it may or may not be fair, uh, he was very empirical and he did try several thousand times to get that light bulb, tungsten wire, just right. And then there was Pasteur, who was uh, a microbiologist, and, uh, and he started off with uh, actually picking the problem and then studying the basic science that was attributed to that problem to try to solve it in, in, with, with, with science. And I think there are all three different approaches to the way scientists and engineers think about problems of the world. However, they took a different track. And we do need all types of flavors. We need the fundamental guy like Bohr. We need the translational person like Pasteur. And we certainly need more empirical people like the Edisonian approach. And I think the reason why we are seeing more and more people in, in the university that are more like Pasteur, picking the big problems, and then going back and trying to fill in the science and the engineering to solve those problems is because there's a kind of a gap, an innovation gap between industry and, uh, and the university. Uh, 